Good morning, this video is sponsored by Coffee. I've done a lot of backend stuff like Rust on the server or Rust doing low level Linux stuff, but did you know that I wasn't always a backend type of person? I did a bunch of front end. And so today we're gonna we're getting a bit full stack. Today we're getting full stack. We are going to use some uh, HTTP server side framework in Rust and put it together with Preact, which is gonna let us do some interactive stuff in the browser. Let's go ahead. What are we gonna do? We're gonna need Tokyo with everything. You can optimize later if you want. And we're gonna make this async and just have it print hello world. Oh, it's missing async. Cool, it's printing hello world. So next up we actually wanna add Axum or just take whatever the latest version is today. Now that we have an async main, I uh, want to do some stuff with Axum main. I this had a server type, so I'm going to let Rustalizer autocomplete that. I know server has bind, so we're going to pass it an address. We're going to listen on uh, this, which means any interface on port 7032. Parse that and wrap that. And then that should give us a builder, so it's not listening yet. And then we need a router here. And we're going to look at, at an example from the Axum docs. Actually, the readme has everything we need. All right, cool. So get and get comes from routing. Cool. So if I do control space, it wants to import all of that. But if I do control dot, it's, it knows that it's uh, the Axum one's the right one. And I just like to call my handlers something underscore get. In this case, we can just return a static stir, and it's going to be high from Axum. And then we can call serve router into make service. And then the server has to... We have to wait it. And then just for convenience, we're going to print what address it actually bound to. This is useful if you specify a port of zero here. I'm going to zoom in. And hence, if you set a port of zero here, you're letting the operating system pick a port for you, which is cool if you write tests, for example. You don't want to have tests use a fixed port, because what if it's already used? Here, I'm okay with it taking a fixed port. I don't think this port is used by anything else on my computer right now, so it, it should be fine. So it has to compile a bunch of stuff, that's why I got a beefy computer. Axum has a lot of stuff enabled by default and we, we, we pulled in the full feature set of Sokyo. So yeah, there's a hundred crates. Okay. And this doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because I'm doing all of this in a VM. And so it's actually listening from my Linux VM. I'm gonna show you. See, it's listening on the VM, and so we can thankfully forward the port from VS Code. Usually it does this automatically. I don't know why it seems broken these days. And now we can access it from the host, which for me is Windows. And it says hi. I always want to save my, my project somewhere, so I'm going to make a new project. I'm going to make it private so nobody's spoiled. And cargo new already initialized the git repository for us, so all we need to do is just commit the thing. It even has a git ignore, so I'm going to call that initial import. And that I can't push because I need to add the remote to this. And now my code is here, and I'm going to be committing and pushing regularly during the video. Cool, so we have hi from Axon. It's not really dynamic yet, I would say. It's just, it's just some text. What if we want to do something more... Fun? Here's an idea. This is completely unscripted. Here's an idea. We could use a crate that gets some information from the system, like use the amount of CPU or something, and it shows it, um, it returns it as part of the endpoint. Let's do that. So I'm looking for a Rust crate that does system information. See if we find something sysinfo. Uh, let's see. 
I was like you use lib.rs instead of create.io because it has a lot more information that is relevant in a, in a way that is, makes more sense to my brain. So if we look at, yeah, it has 600,000 donors per month used in about 500 crates. Seems good. Let's jump directly to the API reference and see if it has something that will change over time. Yeah, CPU usage, amazing. That's what we need. So let's add it. And then how do we use that? You make a new system. Oh, and that's an extension trait, sure. So we can't reuse the, the, the example here because print is just going to print to the standard output and we actually want to build a response. We could make a string and then we can write to the string. We can use enumerate to maybe, what does that return? Yeah, iter enumerate. So we get the index of the CPU as well. We can make it one based. CPU usage returns. Uh, it returns an F32. So it's not really a percentage, is it? Or is it from zero to 100? We don't know what the values look like right now, but yeah, okay. It looks like from one to 100. Just to make the format string a little nicer, we can extract that into a variable. That's the thing with Copilot. See how it completed that line of code and then it wasn't the right function name, it just hallucinated an API. And that happens all the time with uh, GitHub Copilot. So this is complaining because we're missing a trait. We can just grab it. But it's disappointing that there's no order fix for that. Like I did control dot and all you wanted to do was inline the macro, which is a very bad idea. This is what it would look like. I don't like that. I like this. Uh, there's a result here. Well, we're just gonna unwrap everything today. This doesn't need to be mutable. And then we can just return the string, except now the return type is wrong because it's not static string, it's string. But that should work. And now if we visit this, nothing shows. Interesting. So we could do a network tab, see what's happening. Mm-hmm. Cool. Okay, it just prints nothing. Does it think we have no C Yeah, it thinks we have no CPUs at all. I think we, we forgot to refresh CPUs. I think the docs told us to do that and we just didn't. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. <laughs> My bad. Oh, and that's why it was mutt. That's what. That's what's up. Okay, so 0% CPU, that's not great. What if we try and install something in the background? Everything's still at 0%. Hmm. Something's wrong. <laughs> Here's what I found out. It's, please note that the result will very likely be inaccurate. The first call, you need to call the method, method at least twice with a bit of time between each call, like 200 milliseconds, like a good blah, 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 for more information to get accurate value. So we can't do this. So this is this is forcing us to look in, a bit into how Axum does things, because now we need state. So we're gonna make a st app state struct, and in there we're gonna have a system. Yeah, Copilot knows what I want. And then we need to put that state in here. Yes, build a new system. And it has to be clone. Let's see, refresh to use mutable. Clone is not, okay. So we're going to do an arc mutex. This is the base level of like getting out of problems in Rust. Just make an arc mutex and everything will be fine. I'm going to do that into actually, that would be interesting, but no. Dot mutex, no, okay. Sometimes there's shortcuts in the Rustnizer extension and you can just like, I know there's one for dot arc. Prove me wrong, why don't you? Okay, 
Computer just hates me today, it's fine. I've been rude to computer. I get what I have coming. So this is never read. So now we can get the state from here. And the way it works with Axum is with extractors. So there's a state extractor in here, Axum extract state. And this is weird because it's it's um it's doing destructuring. So this looks weird. The first time I saw that, I was like, how do they make that work? But it turned out it's actually just standard Rust syntax. So this is gonna be a state app state. And then we're gonna get the system by doing state sys lock unwrap. Refresh the CPU. Cool. So now the first time we let, let's run it again. The first time we run it, it's gonna be inaccurate. But then, look at that. Uh it's just going up. Cool. So this is updating because I'm I'm refreshing. Let's let's uh Generate some activity. Ooh, you can see it's uh, going up. Nice, very nice. So at this point, the, the video practically writes itself, right? So the problem here is that we have to refresh for those values to update. It would be much better if instead we had a piece of JavaScript in the browser that did those queries, made a bunch of API requests, and then uh, did something fun with them. So, but for now, we're just gonna make that screen that refreshes by itself. Don't forget to add, commit, say what we did. What did we do? Let's use the VS Code stuff. We have add sysinfo. Add sysinfo, make in return state of all CPUs. And then sync. The next step is we don't actually want the root, the root root to show this. We want this, this to be like an API endpoint. So we're gonna make API CPUs, for example. It's gonna be CPUs get. We'll name this to CPUs get, and then root get is just gonna be like before, hello. And then we don't actually need the state in here. And if we run that again, the root just shows hello, and then API CPUs shows CPU values. Now we don't actually want this to return some text here. We actually want this to return some JSON. So we're gonna do JSON blah. What we're gonna do is actually just collect, error collect. Uh, we wanna map this, so for each CPU, we just want the CPU usage. There's gonna be a float from zero to 100. And then, we're collecting all of that into a vector. And then uh, Axum has these very handy wrapper types, so like JSON V here will just return JSON. So we don't actually have to write out the, the, the um, complete return type, we can just have impl into response, which they don't love you using because it can make for very confusing errors, but for here, it, it'll be fine. So that fixed me, this blocks. Yes, I feel bad later. On another uh, handy tip, uh, it has a debug handler macro that you really should use. I don't believe it's enabled for now. It really be the default. If we get the type signature wrong, some of the errors can be very confusing, but we want to use debug handlers so that they're not as confusing. I think it's in macros. Yeah, there it is. Now this should be a vec of float. Let's let's ask Rustonizer what it thinks it should be. And yes, it's a vec of F32. So the shape of our JSON is going to be very easy. There we go. Just an array of numbers. This looks like something we can consume from JavaScript. Let's do that. So now our API is pretty much finished, and we want to look at we want to look into building our front end. And the front end is going to live at the root right here. So normally we just do an include stir. Let's let's start with that. So we're going to have an index.html and then we just write some HTML. Cool. So title is going to be axact because I've decided to name it that. And then the body is just going to be what is the body going to be actually? It's going to be uh, hello from axact via in HTML file. And then same as JSON. This is a wrapper here we can use. HTML, and then we're gonna include stir index.html. And same as the other, we're gonna have input into response here. 
and we're gonna use the debug handler thingy. Now if we run again, we have an actual HTML page. It's ugly as sin, but that's fine. Actually, let me write some CSS real quick. I'm gonna have inline styles, we don't care. You know what, before we do any of that, um, the problem with include stir is if I change the HTML here, I'm gonna have it say goodbye, and then I refresh, it didn't change. It's still using the old content because this is baked into the executable with include stir. So what I wanna do instead is have it load the HTML from disk every time we serve a request, which is not a thing you'd want in production, but it's great in development. So normally you would have like a, an environment variable you can change, that decides if it's development and production, and then in production it reads it once, and in development it can like reload. Here we're just gonna read it from disk every time. We don't care. We don't. We're not actually going to production with this. And because it's in an async response handler, we don't actually want to block like we did here. We are gonna use the um, Tokyo file system things instead of the standard library file system things. But they look very much the same. So read to string. And then because the current directory is gonna be next to the cargo tunnel file, we actually need this time to use src slash index.html. And it's, it won't work if you run it from a different directory, there's ways around that. Let's just make something that works in this case. Again, we unwrap, we don't care. Cool, so now if I run this, It has goodbye, I'm gonna rearrange my windows a little bit. Goodbye for now. And then I can refresh and it, it shows this, which is great. It would be even better if it did auto refresh. That's the thing you can do this. The thing I have for my own website, which is made with Rust. So if you go to my website, this is the production version, but if uh, on my local version, when I actually change the code, it does auto reload, which is very nice. When I change a template, for example. But here we're fine just for loading on our own for now. So we're just gonna make a commit, commit load h and serve HTML from disk. What we're gonna do is vanilla JavaScript. There's gonna be any TypeScript, there's not gonna be bundler setups, there's gonna be nothing. But I am gonna put it in a, in a separate file just because completion, so index.js, and then we wanna make an endpoint for that too. And you know, we could make we could make it better. Like having a separate endpoint for all the static assets is kind of dumb, but I don't mind. And this time it's not actually, uh, it's not actually HTML, it's JavaScript. And there's no wrapper for that. So how do we actually serve JavaScript? We have to make a new response. Builder. There we go. We're missing a cross at UTF-8 if we really want to be modern. Cool, so now we have JavaScript. Uh, what can we do with it? Uh, we actually don't because we forgot to include it here. So script src equals index.js. So it's at the root, so we can just do that. We need to run again because we added a route. We added this route. Is it going to network tab C? Yeah, that it is fetching uh, index.js, which is currently empty. So let's make it not empty. We're going to alert and says baby's first JavaScript file. And then if we reload, it alerts us that we are baby. So JavaScript is cool. Everybody hates it, but it's still cool. I think it's cool because you can use it to do dynamic stuff. So if I do document body content text content, Aha, your markup is mine. And then we remove the alert. Then it doesn't do anything. Because it's null. Because we the DOM takes time to load. So it loads the JavaScript first and then the DOM. So we actually need to add an event listener, DOM content loaded, that's exactly what I wanted. And now it works. Because it gets the HTML, the HTML says, I need JavaScript, it's in the head, so it loads the JavaScript, then it initializes the DOM, and then it executes the JavaScript that's in the event listener. So now this works. And so we can make that dynamic, right? We can have, I don't know, we can set 
an interval. of a variable here. And then JavaScript has fancy strings. Uh, cycle i. Yeah, see how that works. Cycle one, cycle two, cycle three. All right, it works, cool. So we made a dynamic website. This is great. In here, we could also grab the data from our API. So we can do that with fetch, for example. We need to make that async. And then let response, yeah, fetch, cool, nice. So we wanted to use the same protocol and, and the host name and port. So we just use slash slash here and then it's gonna be API CPUs and then JSON equals this await response.json and then we'll just uh, stringify the JSON again. Of course, we actually need to check that the response code is 200. So if response.status is not 200, then we throw an error, which nobody's going to see. So this is going to be in the console, but let's just hope that it works. Uh, again, we don't need to, to rerun the server here. So there has been an error and we don't see it. Name not resolved. Yeah, so I messed it up. Slash slash is for the same protocol, but then you can specify a host here. So we don't want that. We just want like this relative URL. And yeah, now it shows uh, CPU usage. Amazing, which is at 1%. It's weird that it starts at 1%. Huh. Anyway. So we could do that. I'm already not using bundlers for this, but if you want to go even more retro or more minimalistic, you don't have to use anything like Preact. You can just do stuff like this and like directly manipulate the DOM. We can even create DOM nodes, set their styles and stuff like that. And the reason I wanted to try Preact is because it's lighter than React. I'm used to React. And you can use it in the browser without any build tools but you have to make it as a module script. So let's see how that works. We change the type here to module. And I think we really should, the, 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 the file extension should really be MJS. So let's actually change it everywhere just to be pedantic, which is extremely on brand for this channel. Cool. And then we actually like have to rename the actual file. What that means now is that we can import from URLs. This is nice. So now instead of doing text content thingy, we can have an app like this. It's gonna have a EM element, actually a pre element, sounds good. And then the result is going to be, hmm, it's a little bit weird to do it like that, but yeah. And I don't know that we actually need to listen for DOM content loaded now. Let's see what that does. I mean, yeah, it works. So it made a pre element. Let's look at the DOM here. So if I just click on this, we can see there's a body is the pre and it's being updated. So this is, uh, this is why you want something like Preact for a virtual DOM, whatever. It is, you, can, you can update some element and it does diffing and it only applies to it. So there's a bunch of controversy about it. The front end world is, is a mess. I don't, I don't want no part of it. I'm just making stuff that is gonna be cool. So right now we just have numbers, but let's make that graphical. I actually wanna see those as like different bars and this is what we're gonna do next. But first we commit. So actually I, I lied. Before we do any of that, we're gonna use the alternative to JSX called HTM. And what that's gonna do is it lets us use JavaScript template strings like so and write markup almost like if you had actual uh, JSX, which is a, an HTML-like syntax where you can interpolate stuff. Well, you know, we'll have to write a bunch of it so you'll see what it looks like. I don't think we need component at all. So the props are gonna have CPUs, I guess. And then what market do we actually want to return? We want to have a div. Everything's going to be a div. I'm sorry for people with dividers. 
And then for every props.cpus.map, yes, that's what I want. Uh huh. For every one of these, we're gonna have another div. Yeah, except it's not like any of this, it's just like the percentage for now. Like so. And then we, we ideally, we'd need some CSS to go with that. But let's look at what this actually looks like. So render, aha. So now we also use HTML and then we can pass properties to the app component we just made, which is just a function up here. So pass the component and then some uh, props. This piece is gonna be JSON directly. And yeah, I think that should work. Cool. Oh, you can also see that it didn't actually, I thought it was replacing the whole thing, but it didn't actually replace the original markup. So let's maybe get rid of that. Cool. And then, you know, that's too many numbers. We want to trim that a little bit. We can do that with like two fixed, uh, maybe two. I don't know. Yeah, that seems fine. And then we'll, we'll like right align it or center align it or whatever. Cool. I mean, we're pretty far along. I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. Nobody's gonna read those comment messages is what everybody thinks. And that's why they justify themselves making terrible comment messages. Yeah, that's life. So now I want this to be a little graphical. I'm gonna have an index.css file. Let me just uh, speed run you through this. You know, the rule of three says that we really should be making like a generic version of this because we have, we're doing the same thing three times, but I can do what I want. It's my video. So JavaScript was application JavaScript, but CSS is text CSS. Because why not? I'm sure there's a reason. There has to be a reason. So we have the little, our little trifecta here. We have HTML, JavaScript and CSS. And we're gonna give some classes here. So this is terrible. I should use semantic markup and stuff. Using divs for everything is really bad, but you know. So the class here is gonna be bar, right? So let's style our bars. They're gonna be, yeah, background red. Let's make it as ugly as possible with 20 EM height, 2 EM margin, 1 EM. Cool, that's gonna be awful. All right, nothing worked. Why? Because I forgot to include it in the HTML. There we go. It's ugly as sin. This is like programmer art, if this was art. So I actually want to spend some time making this less awful. So instead of doing set interval in my JS, I'm going to do it just once. So let's see how we can make this slightly better. So the first thing I like is picking out a good font. Roboto is, you know, it's not inspired, but it's fine. Import is bad and you shouldn't use it for performance reasons, but see previous comments about caring how production ready this is. Nice. We want to pick some colors. You know, someone else already did the work. Just pick a nice color scheme. That one, I don't like that one. Kind of like this one. Uh, we can use this as the background maybe. And then the bars can be like this. And then the inner and have another background. Well, wow. is it completing from the palette? That would be great. No, it's not. So we want position relative. Oops. And then here we want position absolute and left is gonna be zero, top is gonna be zero, bottom is gonna be zero. And right's gonna be set by preact. So here we want right to be set to, actually we do, oh, we could set the width. Oh, not the height, the width. I forgot that we actually want bar and then inside of there we want bar inner. And that style is for bar inner. The, the color coding in here is not as good as I hoped, but you know, cool. But it's good that it's not refreshing because we can adjust the style a little bit. So how do we get this to center? One of the big 
questions in computer science, how do you center with CSS? The answer is display flex, align items, center, justify content, center. There you go, it's centered. So this is more usable. Let's just have it refresh, you know, every 200 milliseconds. Just to really make our computer be sorry. I, f yeah, I feel like this would look better, you know, vertical. I mean, obviously there's a, there's a simple fix for that. Oh, the center is not. Oh, it's just down there. Hang on. There. Now it's vertical. That's cool. If I try and force install this, CPU is going to be go crazy. Look at this. Ooh, okay. First problem. The, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. The inner bars should be below the text, which we can do. I don't know, this feels more like a span. I'm, I'm you know, vibe-oriented programming at this point. It's gonna be like label, a caption for an item. Is it a label? I don't think it's a label. You know what? I'll make it a label. I tried, you know? In a situation like this, right? You're tempted to do Z index, but it's probably not the right call. Actually, it is probably the right call. The draw order also depends on the order in the DOM. I would have expected this to work because the label is after, but Bar inner is position absolute, so I think it goes on top. I'm giving people a lot of opportunity to correct me in the comments, and that's good content creation. I'm, I'm being a good YouTuber right now. Look at this, now it works. But it's not very smooth. We can do transit, yeah, there we go. Oh, 0.5 is a little much. Launch that again. Oh, look at this. Now it's, you know. <laughs> so the last thing I wanna do in this video is Kind of show you how to bridge sync rust and async rust because so far we have been ignoring problems, but we have problems. It doesn't really show here because I'm the only user of my service locally, but we're blocking here and that's bad. We should be doing this in the background once for every client. This is another problem, by the way. If we have a lot of clients, they're all going to call refresh CPU, and I'm assuming that this is kind of intensive. So what we really want to do is we want to be doing this in the background and we want to broadcast updates to all the clients. And this is where a lot of people get stuck because they know how to do sync rust, they know how to do async rust, but then how do they, how does the... So the first thing we can do is to not actually make it a stream at all, but just have it been done in the background. This is already going to be better because we're only doing the work once in a background thread and we're not gonna block in the uh, web server async code path. So that's already gonna be better. So we're gonna take this. Uh, we're not gonna take this. We're gonna think about types first. So the way we're gonna think about types, the app state is gonna have directly that vec of F32 here in an arc mutex. And this is not what you want. You know, this is an intermediate step to getting where we wanna be. Actually gonna derive default for this. And then we're gonna do Tokyo task spawn blocking. And in here we can have a function. And that function is gonna take ownership of its own copy of app state for BG. Clone, cool. And now look at this. This is all copilot. Why am I even making videos? You know, just tell Copilot what you want to do. Just whisper gently in the mic and it, it can hear you. It can do that now. It can't. It cannot. It's just very clearly <laughs> inferring what I want to do from the, the previous structure of the code. Okay. Oh, we could actually be building our router first. It's going to be slightly cleaner. And we pass app state clone. And then we don't need the 4BG thing here. So this is like query update CPU in the background. Of course, this is not what they told us to do. This is a, a loop. So if we run this, uh, I'm gonna have htop on this side. And if you can guess what happens, you win a cookie that you can bake yourself. So let's just look at CPU usage here. And then this doesn't work anymore because state lock unwrap clone. Yes, perfect. And CPUs. Right, so CPU uses this arc mutex here, so we're locking this temporarily, cloning what's inside, and then releasing the lock. We're not we're not holding that uh, lock guard across the wait points. That would be very bad. Very bad. We would need an async mutex if we did that, but we don't. We're just cloning the stuff and returning. So now, if we run this, you will notice that CPU usage 
goes, eh, you know, it's only using all of one core, which I guess would show up in our little visualization here. Yeah, it does show. The video's title is now Making HTOP in the Browser with Axum and Preact, right? Because you can do everything else. Like, we're only sending CPUs, but you can be sending whatever you want. Uh, so we don't actually want to do that. We want to sleep a little bit. And we can do that with SD thread sleep because all of the like, spawn blocking takes a function that can block. It's okay for this function to block. It's fine. So refresh CPU had that minimum CPU update interval. There we go. Now it's all nice and sort of idle. So that's already better, right? Because now we have this background task and it's doing some amount of work and then all the clients are just getting that same data. So if we do just do a bunch of windows, they should all show the same thing. This one doesn't want to work. All right, it's working now. Okay, we accidentally stumbled upon something that's actually really interesting. First of all, they're not showing the same thing, but also they're really kind of lagging and getting blocked for a long amount, a like long period of time. Do you want to know why? Let's look at this code closer. I didn't, I didn't plan any of this, the beauty of unscripted videos. So what's happening here? We're calling sys refresh CPU, which takes some time, but I'm assuming not that much time. And then this is really, really fast because we're just reading some stuff that's in the sys uh, struct. So it doesn't actually do any calls, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure this is just, yeah, it's just accessing some values in the, in the struct. And then we acquire a lock and then we write to the lock and then we sleep. The answer is that we're not dropping the log before sleeping. So we're holding it through that entire duration. And so we are actually locking here. Uh, how can we test that hypothesis? We can here measure how long it took to acquire the lock. There you have it. Lock time, 200 milliseconds. There are fancier ways to debug something like this, but this works. So let's fix the bug. The bug is we could just do drop CPUs here. This is fine. But sometimes I think it's Clippy that gets confused. So, you know, as a best practice, let's put it into its own scope. And now if we run that again, all right. So now our lock time is zero millisecond all the time, which is what you want to see. It's, it's okay to use synchronous locks in asynchronous code, as long as you don't hold them for a long period of time. Like you don't want to have them locked across await points. But yeah, now this looks pretty okay, right? Let's uh, zoom out just a tiny bit. And then we'll do that same cargo install thing. And we should see that, yeah, you know, there's a delay, but they all kind of display the same thing. And you know why there's a delay? Because they have been loaded at different uh, times and they each have their own interval. Let's look at the JS again to see what I'm talking about, right? It, it does set interval 200, but that's a different time for every page. So what if we actually want those to be synchronized? Wouldn't that be nice? Let's commit and I'll show you how. So the type we want for this, and first of all, why is this, this white? It's getting late, so I'm gonna make this dark mode. Hang on. Okay, it's dark mode now. What are we gonna do now? I got distracted picking colors. Okay, so our goal is to have all of the clients update at the same time with the same data. And one way we can achieve that is with WebSocket. There's other ways. There is server sent events, which I like a lot, but for now, let's do WebSockets. We just need to add another feature to Axum. I know it by heart, but if you don't, uh, have you ever wanted to find the, the features that are create offers? You can go directly to, it's lib.rs page, and then I go to API reference and feature flags, and here they are. Uh, how do WebSockets work? I can never remember. So this thing here is not gonna be JSON anymore. You know what, we'll keep both. We'll make a new endpoint, CPUs WebSocket, called real time. The way WebSockets work is, you take a WebSocket upgrade thing here, and then you do on upgrade, and then you have a callback, and that callback can be async, and, and it takes a WS, which is actually a type of WebSocket. We don't need to say it, but it's neat to make sure. And then from here, we can call real time CPU stream or something like so. And we can unwrap if we want to. Is it going to be able to generate an async function? Yes. Amazing. 
Well, I didn't figure out what the type was, but that's fine. And then there's gonna be a result. No. Just like that. And then from here, we can send some stuff. We can send messages. So messages is an enum. It's imported first, and then we have a text thing that's perfect. So we, this time we're gonna have to bring in survey JSON to serialize our snapshots to text. To string, uh, we don't need to make it pretty. It's fine, and then the value is gonna be, well, let's see, we also need like currently, uh, split screen, boom. Our app state is this, so we need one of these. We need we need the app state here. So that means we need to extract it from that handler. I don't really know how Axum does this, by the way. But just like you specify some things and then it runs some type level stuff. I could make I should make an article about that, because when I don't understand something, I make an article about it and then it's okay. I get it. So now we pass. State. Is this fn once? It is. That's how we can move out of like this. Uh, we don't even have move here. Let's see if it complains. Now CPUs is gonna be app state. CPU, lock, unwrap, clone. There you go. Actually, we don't even have to clone it interesting. Let's see. There we go. Uh, that can fail. No, it can't. And then that's the payload. Um, Serialize is unhappy because... Yeah. So this is what I don't like about Rust. And then WS needs to be mutable, which is great. And then we need to await this, which is also great. And then this can fail, which is double great. And then we just do that in a loop, right? Endlessly. And I guess we just sleep a little bit. This time it's an async code, so we can't use std thread sleep. We have to use Tokyo time sleep. Sure, 100, whatever. And then I mean, first we can see if it actually does work. So I was gonna show you how to consume it from JavaScript directly, but I actually wanted to show off this. This, this is the WebSocket curl. Yeah, WebSocket. Yes. Okay, let's do that. So cargo install WebSocket. Oh wait, we should we should visualize this. Aha. Cool. So WebSocket works like this. You pass it an address, and Arc is local host seven thousand and thirty-two. Yes. And yeah, it doesn't work if it's not a WebSocket endpoint. So we need to use our WebSocket endpoint, which is, I forget, real-time CPUs. And then unexpected status code, panic, broken pipe, what's happening? I am currently regretting this. I cannot figure out why WebSocket is not working, so I'm just gonna add raising subscriber. I still cannot figure out why WebSocket is not working, so I'm going to use TCP dump. It does send upgrade. But then it sends OK back. Is that bad? Are WebSockets not supposed to do that? Yeah, it's supposed to send 101. Oh! Oh, wow! Okay, that was interesting. I'm glad I spent some time on that. So the problem is that, oh, this is amazing. This is amazingly stupid. So on upgrade returns a response and that response has the status code set to switching protocols, which is 101 and it's what we want. But I, this is a, a wonderful cautionary tale, but, but, but we're not returning this because of this semicolon here. I'm gonna zoom into this when I edit this video. This semicolon here means that we're not returning this. We're throwing it away. It's like we're doing return empty tuple. An empty tuple implements into response. It's just an empty response. So that's why it's sending all of this. 
Anyway, so input into response is dangerous because what if you don't return anything and it looks like it's working, but it's not actually. So I'm glad we actually spent that time. Well, I spent that time. So now WebSocket is happy and it's sending us very often updated uh, CPU things. How, how many times did we? Oh, 100 million seconds. Okay, cool. All right. And now we just need to consume that from index.html. But note that, and this is, the, I'm, I'm pretty happy about the way I went with this. It didn't break the other endpoint. See, it still works. Even though we also have WebSockets. We maintain, we're maintaining both endpoints for now so that the one user, me, who's using this, will not have any outages. So now the backend team is done with that improvement. We can tell the front end team, which is also me, to actually use it. So now it's not going to look like this. We're going to make a new WebSocket. Okay, we have to use like protocol. Uh, cool, this is slightly less stupid. I like it. Mm -hmm. href. Ah, uh, this is smart because it makes like HTTP go to WS and then HTTPS go to WSS and then complete nonsense if it's neither of those protocols. Cool, so we're getting messages. We have data here. Uh-huh. That's a string right now, so we need to parse it. Cool. Now it's an array, and now we need to render. There we go. WebSockets. So nice thing about WebSockets that I like a bunch that also works with um, server sent events. You can see the request here. And if we click on it, we can look at messages, and we can see all the raw data coming on. So we're almost, I'm almost happy with this, we're almost done. So it's time for one penultimate commit. Use the new WebSocket endpoint. But you'll notice that if we open a second window with this, they're still not synchronized, not really. There's a slight delay. I mean, it's updated very often, so you can't really see it, but there's still a slight delay. Um, the thing that really I don't like about our current version of the code is that we have this loop here that updates this at a certain interval. We don't even know what the interval is. The interval could be more or less than 100 milliseconds. I don't know, it's, it's platform specific. And then we have a bunch of other loops here that also sleep. I would like all the WebSocket clients to get the new value when this loop here does one turn. And to do that, we're gonna need a broadcast channel. I'm gonna make a sender here. I'm gonna drop the receiver directly and you'll understand why in a second. And it's gonna take a snapshot. And for now, the snapshot type is just gonna be this vec of F32 that we have. Cool. Now in here, well, first of all, an app state. Gonna want that TX here, yes. And is it, it's not default, but it's clone. We don't need app state to be default anymore. That's fine. But I remove CPU from there. TX is TX .clone. So we have our sender in the app state, which all request handlers have access to. So now we don't need to lock anything anymore. All we do is TX .send, and then we send that. We send the V. And nice thing about uh, broadcast socket, the send function is non-blocking. So we can call that from synchronous code. And then from here, we're gonna subscribe to that sender. We'll just do as long as we get a message from here, then we send something to the web socket. And we don't need to sleep anymore. There we go. Now we're done. And send can fail, it's just unwrap. Aha, sender error. Oh, why is it unhappy like that? So when does this return an error? An unsuccessful send would be one where all associated receiver handles have already been dropped. So that's cool, that means we don't need to unwrap this. Like we just, we know if there's no receivers because it returns error, but we don't really care. Okay, this works. Let's bring tab number two. And now they are 
100% synchronous. You know, there could be some lag and everything, but this is all... I was going to say this is all loopback, but it's... It's a complicated loopback because it's actually running in VM. That actually answers the question I probably should have covered at the beginning of the video. Why would you want to do that when you have something like Iggy? And easy to use GUI and, and pure Rust that I used in some of Advent of Code solutions. You can run that over the, the network is the answer. So like this is all happening in a Linux machine. And I actually, the reason I thought about making a video like this is because I wanted to visualize something that was happening in the Linux VM, not in Windows. I could use something like ngrok to expose that port to the world and have you all look at my CPU usage. If I was doing this live, that's what I'd do. That would be very fun. But yeah, I think we have everything we need. I'm going to publish that repository when the video is up and then I'm going to link it in the video description. Thanks for watching. And yeah, I will do more of these. I think they're fun. Unscripted, just build something cool. This was a prerequisite to another video I wanted to make as I build a little tool using that that does not show CPU usage, it shows something else. I'm, I'm out. I'm this, I've been recording for almost two hours. Hopefully the video won't be that long and I will go edit it and release it now. So take care, goodbye.